On July the 1st, the Supreme Court overturned the conviction of a Pennsylvania man who has been continuously posting violent message on his Facebook page. And today we're here to discuss how the decision will affect for communication and social media in particular. Well, what happened was that uh, Mr. Alonis was posting uh, rap lyrics that referenced his estranged wife and subsequently an FBI agent, a female FBI agent who had come to visit him about the original uh, lyrics. Uh, he claimed that he was just an aspiring rapper and that these were rap lyrics that he was uh, writing. Uh, government took a different position under a federal statute uh, and charged him with making threats against his ex-wife and the, XB, uh, the FBI agent. Uh, he was convicted and it was eventually it reached the US Supreme Court. Uh, the court held that because they had not required any proof of an intent to threaten that his conviction could not be upheld. They interpreted the statute under which he was charged as having an intent requirement, which is very common, in fact, in almost all criminal cases, that you need to intend to violate the, you know, the law. I was just disappointed in the case that the court chose the sort of least uh, adventurous way of handling it, or the narrowest way of handling it, by saying, uh, oh, the statute requires intent, you didn't have intent. I would have liked to see them start to grapple with the whole First Amendment question, which eventually they're going to have to do. But in most cases, courts are loath to go beyond what they have to do. Uh, there are rare occasions where a court will decide to seize a case and use it to establish new rights, new boundaries, etc. But that's not common. My intent to threaten, or is it your interpretation that it's threatening? Uh, under the federal statute now, there has to be at least some intent, but it's not clear how much. Um, some lower courts have in the past sort of assumed it or said it's the you know receiver the listener or viewers view of it as a threat that makes it a threat um, this is a really wide open area social media makes it much worse because in the past I mean direct you know threats would generally be I walk up to you and threaten you you know your money or your life clearly a threat uh, however, when you start posting things that other people can see in a broad uh, basis, it raises different question and a lot of interpretation. It gets even worse when you use something like Twitter because it has such limited you know, space that nuance and detail are obviously lost. And it comes off generally usually as a lot more harsh uh, a lot more bright line than in other media. Uh, but social media is presenting a huge number of legal issues uh, in everything from defamation to threats to privacy. Uh, and the law moves a lot slower than the technology. So at the moment we have in many cases is a lot of questions, either because we're trying to apply you know, old law to new situations or because we don't have law that was developed for it at all. And between Congress, state legislatures, or the courts, we're not getting quick answers. Well, when you get into cyber stalking or cyber harassment, it's really another level. That's where you have repeated messages over and over, people going after a targeted, much different than posting something on your Facebook page. And there the problem most often is identifying the person because they can post anonymously, they can spoof their addresses, all kinds of things, and go after somebody. It's the same problem sometimes with cyberbullying, which is another variation. All of these have huge questions. The second level question, of course, that applies regardless is the First Amendment. 
And the Supreme Court did not address that at all in the Alonis case. So we really have no idea to what degree online speech that could be interpreted as the threat is protected by the First Amendment or not. Uh, the other problem is because the Supreme Court was just interpreting a federal statute, state statutes aren't affected. They have their own rules. Their own courts have to interpret them. Uh, there's a California case with a rap artist right now ongoing. And when he tried to cite Alona's, the state court said, that's federal law. This is California law. You could try suing them civilly. You could go in and try and get an injunction to prohibit them from doing it, restraining order. Um, but in each case, the law is totally unclear on this. Uh, you also have to identify the person. I mean, Alonis, at least, it was obvious. It was his ex-wife. It wasn't like he was hiding it. But in a lot of cases of real serious cyber stalking or cyber harassment, they hide behind an anonymity, which then raises a whole more other legal questions. For example, can you force the provider to identify whoever was posting? Uh, and there are whole questions there because anonymity is also considered part of the First Amendment, the right to anonymous speech. And how far that goes is very unclear. Or when can you get the identity? They're in the same dilemma as the, as the people who are you know, receiving the messages. The line's not clear, they can speak, and then they take the risk that depending on the jurisdiction, depending on the people involved, they may end up in a court battle. And I can't tell you exactly where the line is because the courts have not drawn it, the legislatures haven't drawn it. Um, it's sort of the wild, wild west. Well, the, the problem is, when you put it on Facebook, it is. It was under a federal statute. See, that's what the difference is. Crossing straight lines generally means you bring in the feds. And this was a federal case. So uh, that's another problem with the internet, is jurisdiction. And when you say crossing state lines, how would you characterize crossing state lines? If I read, read the Facebook page in another state, has it crossed state lines? Uh, you, you see the problem. Uh, that's also the problem even internationally now because um, right now there's a big controversy over something called the right to be forgotten and withdraw, you know, taking down links by Google and European privacy directive and all that is where it's happening and the data commissions. Well, originally when they started applying it to Google, Google would simply take it down from Google Spain or Google France. French have now ordered Google to take it down from all their services. And Google has said no, um, because ultimately that would mean the most restrictive government in the world would be setting the rules for everybody. So yeah, this whole, there's no there there uh, internet issue. You know, where is the cloud? Uh, and whose law applies to the cloud? California has, pub has actually passed a uh, law for minors to be able to remove or social media have to provide them a way to remove things that they have posted but only what they have posted you know because let's say I post let's say I took a picture at a party and you were <clears throat> shall we say uh, not in your best moment and I post it you don't have a right to have me take it down why should you? Um, now, if you can try and argue I'm defaming you or I'm putting you in a false light or something, you can try and sue me. But this whole right to be forgotten, who gets to decide how to shape history? I mean, that's the flip side. You know, I'm sure everybody still remember it, but Bill Clinton would love to <laughs> erase certain things, right? Uh, so where's the line? And yeah. Yeah, it's horrifying that now every little peccadillo is out there forever. The internet doesn't forget and the internet distributes everywhere. You know, the things I did in college are long buried. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um,
but now it's everything. But how do you, how, how do you say it? So now you have, and you have a lot of privacy advocates fighting with First Amendment advocates, and it, it's a real, it, it's a real mess. But then if, if, as soon as you say, oh yeah, you can get the stuff taken down, well then just who decides what gets taken down? Um, you know, is it the person? Is it the company, Google? Is it a government official? On what basis do they make that decision? Does it matter if the person is public or private? In other words, the same story about Joe Schmo, maybe it could be taken down. About Rand Paul, maybe not. You see, you see. Um, <laughs> and as it is in Europe, right to be forgotten requests are in the millions. So how do you even handle the volume? For Arlington Public News, I'm Yves Leo.